welcome to Pollination Puzzles with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. My name is Sarah Flynn and I'm joining you from Edmonton, Alberta, here on Treaty 6 land. Now we have schools joining us from all over Canada today. I'm so excited to welcome you all. We have schools from Ontario, in Toronto, Renfrew County, Aganville, Rockwood, Kalilo, Sault Ste. Marie. We have Thompson, Manitoba. We have Gatineau, Quebec. Oh my goodness, we have BC, we have Kelowna and Vancouver, we have Summerland, in Alberta we have Calgary, we have Olds, we have Wetaskiwin, we have Sherwood Park, Drayton Valley, Edmonton, and uh, St. Albert as well. And we have our East Coast schools, St. John's Newfoundland and Oxford, Nova Scotia. Oh my goodness, Kaylee, who is our guest today from the Canadian Wildlife Federation. We have so many schools from across Canada. We had 107 schools interested in attending our event today, which is just wonderful that we're all thinking about pollination and what's going on in, in the environment right now as we head into spring this important time of year where insects and wildlife and everything's coming it feels like it's coming back to life now we're joining from coast to coast and i want to start by acknowledging that we all of the indigenous lands and all the indigenous peoples that live in the lands where we are located today while we're meeting virtually I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands that we all call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relations between um, Indigenous nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, Métis and First Nation peoples that call this land home. So, Kaylee, we had a question and I'm going to pose it now so that our friends who are joining us on YouTube can also have a crack at it before we give the answers. So we asked in the Zoom room before we, before we uh, started the meeting here, um, how many species of animals are pollinators uh, in Canada? So how many animal species exist in Canada that act as pollinators. And so we're taking, we have lots of guesses here on the room and I'm gonna give a few minutes um, and you can give maybe some of your hints as we go through. We have um, Lucas thinks five, Saul says eight, Margaret says 100. We have our friend Russell in old said 950. Um, oh, we have a very precise guess from Evergreen School who says 1,728. Oh my goodness, there's so many gets. Wyatt thinks 99. There's so many great guesses here on the number of animal species that are pollinators in Canada. I'm going to see if anyone here on YouTube, but you give a couple of hints while they think about it and get to us. Okay. Wow. We were saying that I see some people were naming some types of pollinators. So we saw people say bees and some people said butterflies, but this is a bit of a tricky question because there are actually lots of different species of bees and butterflies, as well as other pollinators. So I see some really close guesses. I see some really big ones too. People, I don't know if you went out and tried to count them all, but uh, there's some people who are getting pretty close. Yeah, we have Madame Slavin's class on the YouTube is saying 2,000. And then guess. Shane was like, make sure don't forget bees. He's, he wants to make sure the bees are not forgotten because he knows they're important. Oh, lots of guesses of 2,000 coming in on the internet. All right, Kaylee. Okay. Let's okay. Drum roll, please, everybody. Okay. There are actually about 1,000 pollinating species. So some people guessed almost right on. I think a couple people guessed 1,000. So yeah, 1,000 species of pollinators which is pretty amazing. That's a lot of, you know, bees and butterflies and birds all helping out with that process. So good guesses, everybody. Well, there's a lot of wows in the, in the chat here. Such a fantastic to think about all these animals that are working to make our ecosystem and to keep us healthy and fed and full of breathing wonderful air. And I just can't wait for you to tell us more about pollinators this morning. Perfect. Well, I am so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, everyone. My name is Kaylee. I work with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, and it's a really fun job because we work to research different species. We do conservation work to help conserve habitat for species. And then we also get to talk about species and help educate others and learn more. So today I'm super excited to talk to you about pollinators. 
that's our theme for today. And especially pollination puzzles, because what we're going to do today is we're going to learn a bit more about Canada's pollinators and talk a bit about how plants have adapted to attract those pollinators. And then I'm gonna put you all to the test to see if you can help me solve some pollination puzzles. So are you ready to get started? Thumbs up if you're ready to get started today. Right on, okay. So before we get started, how many of you have heard of the word pollination? Has anybody, does anybody know, has heard pollination before? Some people. Yes. Yep, there's lots of people are, mm -hmm. you know what's going on. Right, perfect. Okay, well, for those of you who don't, here's a quick picture to help explain how pollination works. Basically, pollination is how plants reproduce. So a pollinator will visit a flower and often to collect the nectar, the sweet sugary nectar to eat. And while it's at that flower, pollen, which grows on this part of the flower called the anther, will get rubbed onto the pollinator's body. So, you know, gets all over them, a little dusting all over them. And then when they, you know, leave, they carry that pollen to another flower. And then the pollen gets deposited into the flower, into this part called the stigma, which is where the seed is. And it fertilizes the seed. And then the seed will um, disperse and grow into a new plant. So pollination is really important because that's the process by which plants can fertilize and produce seeds and grow. So that's, you know, all kinds of flowering plants. A lot of the crops that we eat as food need pollinators to be produced. So it's really important. And it's important for the pollinators because that's how they get their food, but also really important for the plants because that's how they grow. So that's basically what pollination is all about. And so today I want to introduce you to some of Canada's pollinators. So maybe, um, if, so those of you who have the chat, if you have ideas of some of the pollinators that are in Canada, you can write them down. I know we heard bees, someone said butterflies. Does anybody know any other types of pollinators that might be in Canada? Looks like Darius has suggested spiders, and Mr. Ezard's class in Kelowna has bees and bats and butterflies. When I saw that someone had said wind, I have to scroll up to see who it was. There oh, was smart. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I mean, to move. Oh, hummingbirds as well. We have Lord Beaconsfield says wasps and flies. Oh, my goodness. The, wow. Coming up with such great suggestions. Yeah, these are so great. Absolutely. So let's meet some of them. So bees. Everybody knows bees, right? Bees are amazing pollinators. There are over 700 native bee species in Canada, and they are the most efficient pollinator. They're actually responsible for pollinating like 80% of our crops. And they're just really efficient because their bodies, they collect it on their legs and their bodies. So you can see, especially this is a bumblebee, how furry he is. All of the pollen gets stuck on their fur and then they carry it over to other plants, so they're really efficient. But I think I also saw wasps. Now wasps are also pollinators. There's about 500 species of wasps in Canada. And bees and wasps kind of look the same, but they're a bit different. And what's a fun fact about bees and wasps is bees are vegetarian, so they just eat pollen and drink nectar but wasps are omnivores and omnivores means that you eat both plants and you eat animals. So they eat other insects too. So that's a little bit different. And I think we've probably all seen wasps before when we're having a picnic, they can sometimes swarm around because they can live in groups, but both bees and wasps can also live by themselves sometimes in the ground. So there's lots of different species of bees and wasps. And I saw somebody guessed hummingbirds well, hummingbirds, there are five species of hummingbirds in Canada. So not as many as bees and wasps, but they eat insects and they drink the sugary nectar in plants because they need lots of energy because everybody, you know, has seen a hummingbird, they're like flapping their wings so fast. So they need lots of energy and that's what they get from nectar. But they do also eat bugs. And you know that they transport pollen uh, because it will stick to their cheeks near their beak. When they got their beak in, they'll get pollen on and then they spread the pollen that way. We've also got butterflies. So they are 
maybe less efficient pollinators than bees because they're not as furry, but they have um, a long, it's called a proboscis. And it's a long narrow tube that lets them drink nectar from flowers. It's like a straw. So they stick their proboscis in the flowers and slurp up the nectar and they're active in the daytime. Um, and similar to butterflies are moths. So moths are nocturnal though. So moths are active at nighttime, whereas butterflies are active in the daytime. And the other thing is anyone know how to tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth? They kind of look similar, but if you see a butterfly resting, it'll usually have its wings up. Whereas if you see a moth resting, it'll have its wings down. So that's a good way to tell the difference between a moth and a butterfly. Butterflies often will rest and have their wings up like this, and moths will have their wings down like that. We've also have flies. Who would have thought? Flies are also good pollinators because pollen sticks to their bristly bodies when they move pollen around. Not as good as bees. Bees are the number one, but they still do a good job. And beetles too, especially hairy beetles. They're more effective than the smooth body beetles because they can attract, like, stick the pollen on them. But they eat pollen, they eat insects, and uh, so they like to frequent flowers because other insects are there, so their food is there. And then somebody said wind and water, which is such a good guess too, because all of the other pollinators we were talking about are called biotic pollinators, which means they're alive, they're living. But wind and water are abiotic, which means that they're not alive. But they're important too because, um, oops, sorry, wind um, is good for plants that have lots of pollen. It'll blow the pollen around and spread it. Uh, and wind can carry pollen more than like 180 meters. Um, and water is not very common, but when plants like aquatic plants that live in the water, sometimes pollen will float on the water to other plants. So water is also a pollinator, but it's not an alive one. It's an abiotic pollinator. So look at all this diversity of pollinators we have. And I know somebody in the chat said bats and bats are pollinators too, because bats um, are nocturnal. They'll go travel to flowers and drink the nectar. But what's interesting to note is that none of the bats in Canada are pollinators because they all eat insects. They're not, they're not drinking nectar from flowers. So in the world, they are pollinators, but in Canada, none of the bat species are pollinators. And I saw a question in chat about are ladybirds or ladybugs pollinators? Yes, they're actually beetles. That's a type of beetle. So they help pollinate there too. So yeah, lots of different kinds of pollinators in Canada. Lots of species, like we said, over a thousand species. And there's questions on YouTube and here in the chat about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes? Well, I don't know a lot about mosquitoes. I know that some they can sort of spread. It's going to be little, little granules of pollen because they're not very big. So they might spread the, like a little bit here and there and help. A lot of insects might, but they're not very efficient pollinators. Mm -hmm. right. So with that, you know, we've got all these different pollinators. How do you think plants have adapted to attract the pollinators? Does anybody, has anyone heard of adaptations? Does anybody know what an adaptation is? No? Well, it's super easy. Adaptations are characteristics that plants and animals have that help them survive in their environment. So some of the things that might help a plant survive or attract a pollinator are things like... Well, Lord, do beacons feel elementary? <gasps> do we have somebody who wanted to guess? Oh, I see smell, yep. Yeah, and colors has come through. Yes, okay, keep going. What else? Anybody else? Anyone else have some ideas here? Um, Perfect guesses. More colors, more smells. Lots of people think that's a great idea. Yep, you can smell the flower. You uh, can, the color, the shape. Patterns. patterns, yep, absolutely. Anybody else have any thoughts on that one? Oh, Ayanna, you want to have a guess? Yeah. Yes. Okay, what do you get there? Um, like, like, like a mosquito. Yeah, what would a mosquito be attracted to? Could be Attract. a smell. Yeah, 
Yeah, I see the taste. Yeah, what they want to eat, you know, it depends what the mosquito wants to eat or what the pollinator is looking for. They might be attracted to the nectar or the pollen. So yeah, I think you guys have got most of them. So shape, so the shape of a flower, is it flat? Does it have a nice landing place for pollinators or is it tube shape? Is it hard to get into? That makes it a difference. Doesn't, it doesn't look that hard. It can be for some pollinators and we're going to show you that here coming up. So yeah, smell. Does it smell really sweet? Is it kind of spicy? Does it smell really bad? Like you could smell like rotting meat? Whoa, that would attract certain pollinators. And you said the colors and the patterns. So what color is the flower and what are the patterns? Some pollinators like certain kinds of colors and others can't see other colors. So, you know, that makes a big difference. And then the timing, I think nobody guessed timing, but when does the flower bloom? Does it bloom in the daytime? Does it bloom at nighttime? If the animals are sleeping, they won't be there to pollinate the plants. So that makes a difference too. And then the food. So we said the taste. Is there lots of pollen? Because some pollinators like to eat the pollen. Or is there lots of nectar? Because some just want the nectar. So if a, if a plant doesn't make nectar, some pollinators won't go there. So these are things that plants have that attract different pollinators to them. So we're going to go through them in a little bit more detail. And I want everyone to pay attention and try to remember because later on we're going to use these hints to help us crack our pollination puzzles. So with shape, we talked about shape, right? Open and flat flowers. There's lots of space for pollinators and insects to land on the flower. So bees and flies and butterflies need a flat flower to land on. They need to have a space, kind of like a helicopter pad to land. Then there's like clusters of little flowers. Well, beetles and moths actually kind of like that where they have a bunch of different flowers. They often a lot of bugs are hidden in there and beetles like to eat bugs and pollen. So clusters of flowers attract different types of pollinators. And then like a bell shape, so sort of like a cup, like a trumpet or it's a tube. So it's deep and everything's kind of hidden inside. That's tough for some pollinators like bees because there's nowhere to land. So they have to have a long beak like a hummingbird or maybe um, like that proboscis like a moth to stick their nose in. And the nice thing about moths, they don't need a place to land. They can hover like hummingbirds, but butterflies need a place to land. So they, you know, they need to be able to get the, the nectar out of the flower. And then exposed. So plants that don't have petals at all, there's nowhere to land. Um, and that plant is just exposed and the pollen's floating in the air. Well, that's really good for wind because the pollen will just blow as the wind hits it and it will spread to other plants. So the shape matters. So it's good to think about it. If you see this bell-shaped flower, it's probably not a bee because the bee's going to have a harder time getting in. Although bees are pretty good at pollinating most things. Like the hummingbird would probably be better at pollinating this type of flower. So that's shape. Now let's talk about smell. So there's sweet smells and spicy. Fermented smells are kind of like sour or they smell a bit yeasty like bread. And rancid is like bad. Like when you smell bad garbage or rotting things, that's what rancid smells. So some like that smell. I don't think we like that smell. And then some don't care about smell. So sweet bees and Beetles and butterflies and moths, they all like that sweet flowery smell. But beetles also will like spicy and fermented smells. So that's different. Like they like that. They like to be attracted to those different smells. And does anyone have an idea what pollinator might like a really bad smell? Anybody know? I think we've seen insects maybe around poop in the summer. There's like dog poop or if yeah. you farm you'll see horse poop and you'll see some sorts of animals there oh flies yeah I flies. see it flies they yeah. love that smell that nasty smell they like things that smell like that so that attracts them and then what doesn't care about smell well actually hummingbirds can't smell they don't have smell like they aren't the ability to smell so they don't care what a flower smells like 
And wind doesn't care. Wind and water don't care. They just blow and all the time. So smell makes a difference too. Now color, there's so many kinds of colors of flowers. There's light colored flowers that are white and yellow. There's bright colored flowers that are pinks and purples. Uh, there's red flowers. And then there's dark ones like dark browns and reds and purples. And then also some pollinators don't care about color either. So for light colored, bees love whites and yellows and so do beetles. And moths are nocturnal. They're active at night, right? So it's really hard for them to see certain colored flowers at night, but white flowers really stand out. So they like white flowers. So if it's a nighttime nocturnal pollinator, they often like a white flower because they can see it really well in the dark. So that's a, that's a good clue. And then bright colors, bees and butterflies love bright colors. Um, lots of pretty bright colors in the garden. But what's interesting about bees is they can see UV light, which is like a something humans can't see. They can see different patterns on a flower because they have an extra sense of sight with their UV light. But did you know they can't see red? Bees can't really see red flowers. But hummingbirds and butterflies can't. So this is where they so get as cats, they can't see red. Which ones can't see red? Cats too. Oh, they can't see? Yeah, some species can't see certain colors. I think right? it's gray. Yeah, so with the red, this is where hummingbirds and butterflies kind of get to come and play a bit more, <clears throat> excuse me, because bees can't really see them. So hummingbirds and butterflies can, so they will help pollinate red flowers. So that's another really good clue. And dark colors that look kind of like that muddy color um, flies like that. And then wind doesn't care what color a flower is. It blows no matter what. <laughs> So those are some colors. And now timing. So is the flower blooming in the daytime or at nighttime? And is the pollinator awake in the daytime or is it awake at nighttime? Most pollinators are out in the day. We see a lot of them, right? We see bees and hummingbirds and butterflies. These are all out and active in the day. But a few of them are active at night. Like I said, moths are active, they're nocturnal. And some beetles too, and bats, where bats are pollinating, they're out at night too. So flowers that bloom at night, they only have a, a few pollinators that'll come and help them out. And of course, wind blows anytime, day or night. So the wind doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Wind and water are active both in the day and night, exactly. So timing matters. So we want to pay attention. If I have a clue that says the plant is only going to bloom at nighttime, you know it's one of these, a moth, a beetle, or the wind probably. And then finally, this is our last round of hints that we're going to, you know, have to remember, is what is the food source? So there's pollen, which are those little dusts. That's what pollination is about. They travel to other flowers and fertilize. But plants also make nectar. Nectar is like a sugary, sweet, syrupy um, substance that's inside the plants and it's full of energy. Pollen is more like protein and it also has energy. And yeah, I think someone said bees like pollen. They actually eat some pollen. They feed it to their young when they're larvae. Um, beetles will eat pollen and flies, but most of them will drink nectar. So bees do both. So great job. Uh, yes, bees will do both. Um, flies sort of will have both too, but hummingbirds and butterflies and moths, they're just in it for the nectar. They don't really care as much about the pollen, but they'll accidentally carry it to other plants. So that's an important clue too. And then of course, wind, wind doesn't eat anything, but wind can blow pollen around. Nectar's kind of inside the flower, so it doesn't blow very easily, but pollen can get blown around. So that's why I put wind with pollen. That's a trick too. Okay, so are you all ready? We have to remember things like, remember we said bees, they can't see red plants very well. Hummingbirds, you know, they can get into those tube shaped flowers. Um, thing, some are active in the day and night. So remembering some of our, our hints, I want you all now to help me 
solve these pollination puzzles. So what we're going to do is you're going to help me match up the pollinators to some of their favorite flowers. And at the bottom of each screen, there's going to be seven pollinators and they're going to be numbered. And so Sarah, what, what do you think is the best way for everyone to show us what they think the pollinator matches? So those of you who are joining from a class, we want you to hold up your fingers. So if you think it's number four, give us a number four. And if you're joining, um, if you're homeschooling and you don't want to turn on your camera, you can type it into the chat here. Or for those who are joining us on YouTube, as a class, you decide, is it going to be number two? Is it going to be number seven? And you type it into the chat on, chat on YouTube and we'll bring it into this meeting. We'll get everyone's guesses. I'm very excited to see yes. how. That. Yeah, so hopefully you can work together to help solve these puzzles and we'll put our yep. knowledge to the We've got a lot of people practicing, typing in their sevens. Excellent, yeah. Okay, here we go. Ready for round right. one? Here are my hints. This flower is called a columbine. Now the first hint is it has red flowers. Mm. Do you remember? Mm. Okay, that's a good hint. The next hint is it's tubular shaped. So there's not a very good landing pad for pollinators. Well, we already have guesses. guesses. Good, yeah, good guesses. There's a few more hints. There's no smell. Doesn't really smell. It's not a very smelly plant. Mm -hmm. And it has lots of sweet nectar and sticky pollen. And the flowers are open during the day. So I see lots of threes. People are guessing hummingbird. Hold up your hands and guess if you're in the classroom. Okay. Well, I see yeah, some good fours things. in Miss okay. Montgomery's class. Mm -hmm. Some threes. Uh, oh, lots of threes in Miss Bychick's okay. class. Okay. So we know that bees can't see red flowers, right? So it's probably not a bee. And, uh, and it doesn't have very much smell. So there's a couple pollinators that don't have a sense of smell, right? The wind and hummingbirds. So yeah, those who guessed hummingbird, number three. Yes, we, you we got it right. right answers on YouTube as well. Our friends in Madame Slavin's class got it right. And Pauline got it right. Oh, way to Good go, job. guys. So you guys, you can see this is, he hovers underneath and gets the nectar out using its beak and then maybe gets the pollen on its face in the process and carries that to another plant. So yeah, columbine, hummingbirds love columbine. So great guessing everyone. Are you ready for round two? This is, might be tougher, so get ready. You lost this, okay. This is a raspberry flower. They're usually white or light purple, so light colored. If you remember what pollinators like light colors. They're open and flat, so lots of room to land, lots of space to land on. They have pollen and nectar. So do you remember what types of pollinators need both? That's a good one. That's a good hint. And they're open day and night. So this is tricky because maybe it could be a couple things, but there's one that really loves this flower. So I see some guesses coming in. Hold your hands up. What do you think? Oh, twos and fives and anyone at Watson I see Miss Ross class I see some two fingers hanging up in the air in Miss Ross class okay oh, same with Mr. Ezzards in in Kelowna lots of twos lots of twos good guessing okay well we know that white plants we know some of the nocturnal ones like white plants but so do bees bees also like light colored plants um it's open and flat so there's a nice place to land um, and they have pollen and nectar, so it's actually the bees that like it. And the big difference, because I think some of you were guessing moths, and that was a good guess, but this dut flower, um, and it doesn't maybe have as much of a scent, uh, at least we didn't have a clue that it smelled really strong. And uh, also, you know, bees really love that rich pollen. So this was a tricky one. It could have been one or two. I was trying to fool you, but those who guessed too, yeah, bees love raspberry flowers. So good Our friend guessing. Shane on YouTube guessed two about 14 times. Nice. So three, you are right. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well now let's see if you can get this next one. Well, first I'll show you a picture. It's a bit blurry, but you can see the bee just kind of hanging out on the raspberry flower. Okay, this one. This one is a fun one. This is called Red Trillium and it has dark red flowers. It is open, so it's easy for pollinators to get to but it doesn't have any nectar. So any of those animals that want to drink nectar, 
Sorry, there's none available in this flower. And it blooms in early spring. And are you ready for the big hint? It smells nasty. It smells like dirty garbage, rotting meat. Does anybody remember which one likes the stinky smell? Hold your hands up if you remember. Well, I saw, I think Mr. Mundor's class, at, is it Dorothy Walker? The, I saw a girl there with her finger up number one after the first clue. So they uh, they really came in strong on. Good um, one, because yeah. yeah, it's that fly. It's the fly. Mm -hmm. And I have to show you a really cool picture because here, this is up close to the flower. You can see a spider. Do you know what that spider did? It knew that flies like this flower and it's built its web right in there so it could catch the flies to eat them. So how tricky is that, that it took advantage and built its web right in the middle of that flower to catch those flies. So good guessing, everybody. Okay, mm -hmm. next one is goldenrod. It is yellow flowers and they're in small clusters. Do you remember what kind of pollinators like clusters of flowers? And it has lots of different insects that get attracted. So this pollinator probably likes to eat insects too, not just the pollen. And they're spicy smelling. It kind of smells like licorice, they say, this one. Oh, I see guess is coming in now. And it's got heavy, sticky pollens. So I see some threes and fours. Hold your hand up, you think. Okay, it's, yeah. It's really stumping them. Lots this of is a tough one. Yeah, I'm kind of making it hard. But remember, some of them like the yellowy flowers, eats pollen and in insects. It's a beetle, actually. Wow. Yeah. Madame Slavin's class got it on YouTube. Way to go. Lots. Good job. Lots of guesses. Yeah, it's a tough Great one. Guesses. But they like that cluster of flowers where they can find bugs to eat. They like the spicy smell of the flower and they do like yellow flowers too. So, okay. So you can see there's a beetle hanging out on a goldenrod flower. Um, just kind of chilling. So this one, this one is especially tricky. These flowers are green and plain, not showy. And parts of the flower are exposed. So the pollen's out in the open. There's no petals to land. There's nowhere for any of the pollinators to land. So that's tricky. And they have no smell. So how are they gonna find the, the flower? There's no smell and there's no nectar. So there's nothing for some of them to eat. So, this is a tricky one. is very convinced that it is number seven. Yeah, He's typing who else is holding up? I see here. The people have two hands up. Yeah, it's a lot of people. I see I, Mr. Ezzard's class is guessing. I see we have mm -hmm. our friend Beth logging in. Or, uh, I think it might be her son. Oh, Miss yeah. Miss Kirsty's class. They're all jumping up with the sevens in the air. Oh, I, miss and I thought I was going to stump everybody, but... Oh. Oh, and I didn't even say the last clue. And it makes lots of pollen. I didn't even say the last clue and you already know. It was wind because all the pollen is out on the branches so that when the wind comes, it just blows onto the other plants. So those of you who guessed seven, perfect. Jonathan and Kezia were very strong with the sevens. <laughs> nice job, guys. Okay, I can't even stump you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can see this is a corn plant up close. Do you see all of those little yellow bits? That's where all the pollen would be so that when the wind blows, the pollen would go and then land on other plants. So it doesn't even need to have one of the biotic pollinators, the living pollinators, it uses wind. Okay, this one has pink flowers, clusters of pink flowers. It's called milkweed. They have a sweet smell. They smell very sweet and lots of nectar in narrow tubes. So it's hard to get to for some pollinators. Well, that one changed a few guesses. Mm. And oh. there's lots of room, lots of room to land on the flower, nice landing area. And they're open day and night. So what do you think? It's lots of room to land, but you do need to be able to get into the tubes to drink the nectar. So you maybe need a beak or remember we talked about that proboscis that's like a straw to slurp up the nectar. It's like these threes and fours, you don't want to guess. Hold your hands up what you think it might be. Miss Gersky's class jumping up and down with the threes. Ooh. Same with Mr. Mundor. It's a four. That was oh, such four, a good trick. I did. Oh, because no, it was four. Some of you got it. Yes, I saw. 
good one. And it's tricky because hummingbirds, they would probably like this flower too, but they don't need a place to land, whereas butterflies need a nice open place to land. So yeah, this one is a really good match with butterflies. In fact, milkweed and monarch butterflies go really well together. Monarch butterflies really love milkweed. They lay their eggs on milkweed and they like to drink the nectar. So this is a really good plant for butterflies. Other pollinators might like it too, but butterflies really love it. Okay, great job, everyone. Really good guessing. There's a picture you can see. And do you see, can you see the proboscis? Little straw in the middle, slurping up right down into the flower. So pretty cool how they can do that. Okay, this is our last puzzle. And this one might be tricky. This is a yucca flower. It's also called soapweed. And it's only found in Alberta, actually, native. Sometimes people have it in their gardens. But it has white flowers has white flowers and they're bell shaped. So kind of like a cup. So not the easiest to get into per se. And they have a very strong, sweet smell, very fragrant smell, very nice smelling. See some guesses already. Now here's the trick, they bloom at night. So which one of these pollinators is active at night? That is the trick. Good trick. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. All so right, what I do see, see hands up. Lots of jumping, some fives, uh, Saul and Russell. Um, oh, lots of fives in all over. Yeah, and I see people waving their fives around uh, again. Mr. Ezra's class going crazy with the fives. You Stay are with. all so good. It is the moths, because remember, the moths are nocturnal, so they're out at night. And actually, yucca plants um, are really mainly pollinated by moths. You can see this tiny little moth on top of the inside of the yucca plant. And they usually rest in the day. They sometimes rest on the plant. And then at nighttime, they move around and pollinate. So they do stuff at night when all the other pollinators are sleeping. So they're really important too. So great guessing, everybody. And that was my last puzzle. Great job, you solved all the pollination puzzles. So let's give ourselves a round of applause for remembering all those fun facts. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. And some of you might think, well, why do I need to know about plant adaptations and pollinators and what attracts pollinators? But I was thinking about this today. I thought, you know, when you're outside and you might be outside having fun or being at a picnic, and you might see bees or wasps come. I mean, how many people are a bit scared of bees and wasps because um, they want to get, they might get stung? Yeah, well, if you wore yellow, that might be bad because the bee would think you are a flower and want to come over. But if we wore red, maybe the bees wouldn't be as interested because remember bees can't see red. Um, so we can learn a bit about um, what bees are in, interested in, or if we have sweet smells like pop and sodas out, that might attract pollinators to us. Um, it's also good because we might learn what types of flowers pollinators like, so we can plant them in our garden. So we know that bees like bright colors and whites, we could go out and plant those in our garden and we'll see so many more bees coming um, to pollinate, which is really good both for the plants and the bees. So. All these things are really great to help us understand pollinators a bit better and understand the plants. So with that, I think we've got a bit of time left for questions. So I don't know, Sarah, if any questions are coming in. I think that uh, we will have lots of questions. I am very certain of that. Now, we have lots of friends here in this meeting room. And so if you have a question and you are on, we'll start with Kezia because Kezia always asks amazing questions. And then if you have a question and you're in a classroom, maybe you can use the, the hand, raising hand function or you can wave your hand or you can come up close to the microphone where you can ask it. And so we'll try to get a question from every site and not repeat. And then for our friends on YouTube, if you wanted to type your question in the chat, I'll make sure that we get it into this room to ask it of Kaylee. So everyone's going to have a chance to sort of raise their hand and ask questions. We'll get to as many as we can today. And I know there's going to be some great stuff coming in. Ru I see Russell's hands up as well. But I thought Kezia was first up. I saw her hand first. She was very excited to go. So Kezia, over to you. How do bees make their hive? 
How do bees make their hives? Well, that's a really great question. I don't know a lot about bees myself. I'm not a bee expert, but a lot of what they do is um, they, you know, they use, uh, well, they kind of create these wax structures and it's mainly to lay their eggs. So they create these little um, areas to lay their eggs and then they'll seal them off and then, um, those eggs will hatch and they'll turn into larva and grow. And when that, that bee larva gets big enough, it'll break out of the hive and it will become a bee. So there's kind of a whole process involved where, you know, they're collecting um, the pollen and create, turning it into like the beeswax. But not every uh, bee lives in like a big social hive. Like we think of bees, we think of honeybees that live in big groups. But some bees live in like the ground. So they might build their hives in abandoned burrows that like maybe badgers or owls had and they're not living in anymore. So sometimes they'll actually build their hives in there too. So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting if you see pictures of, of uh, beehives, but just remember there's a bunch of different kinds of bees. So different bees will have different hives. Awesome, thanks for a great question. So I see lots of hands in Miss Montgomery's class. And so maybe if one of you wants to get ready, I'm gonna ask a question from the chat here. And if someone wanted to stand up and get ready in Miss Montgomery's class, ask the next question after that, that would be amazing. So. Um, in the chat here, Jacob is wondering about um, if bees get diseases, because he's kind of heard something about that. Yeah, bees can get diseases. Um, there, as I said, there's different kinds of uh, bees. So different bees are susceptible to different things. But um, there's like one and it's called, uh, col it's, it, it's like colony decline disease and researchers are studying it because they don't know exactly why it happens. But what they're finding with some bee colonies like honeybees is the bees will be there and then they'll abandon their nest and disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, and they call that colony decline. So they're not really sure why that is. They don't know if some, there's like some signals that are happening with the bees that gets them to get lost and not find their way back. But it's really uh, um, causing a lot of problems for some of the honeybees and the bees that live in colonies because sometimes the colony will be doing really well and then all the bees will disappear. So researchers are studying that because they don't know exactly why they're, they're not finding their way back to the hives. But maybe if you are all interested in being researchers, that's something that you could study when you grow up too, is look at some of these things that are affecting bees and why that's happening. But we don't have an answer yet. Uh, yeah, that's, it's really dangerous. I hope that they are able to maybe come up with some of these reasons and why it shows it's so important for science to be working with, with citizen scientists and with educators to really sort of figure out some of these problems that are, are you know, within our, our environment and our species. All right, Miss Montgomery's class. Is there someone who's ready at Anne McClintic? Um, I think it's Anne McClintic. Did, if you'd like to unmute, we would love to have a question from one of your students. There we go. I see someone standing up and walking over right now. All right. Don't be expert. What's that? I know what their hive is made of. Oh, do you? You must know more too. You know yeah. about beehives? Can you tell us? Yeah. They're made of wax. Oh, yeah, the wax, the beehive. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go to um, Russell now. Russell was very patient. And then we're going to go to Evergreen, Miss Bychuk's class. I see someone is, has their hand up very patiently. They can come up to the front and wait. So Russell, over to you. Um, I have seen a wasp nest with no bees in it, with no wasps. With in no it. wasps in it. Oh, oh awesome! Yeah. Thanks, Russell. They good can abandon them. And remember, like some wasps, I think it's good for us to remember too. So some wasps will big build those nests, and we'll see them. They're like big, kind of papery nests. They make those out of wood fiber. But also some wasps live by themselves in the ground too. So there's different kinds of wasps. Some live in groups and some live by themselves. So when you see the ones that they're all together, those are ones that live in groups. So in Madame Slavin's class on YouTube, Easton is wondering why bees can't see red. Why is that? 
Oh yeah. So, and I saw a couple questions about what colors bees can see. So everyone's seen like a rainbow, right? There's a full kind of color spectrum of colors and we have eyes, we can see certain colors, but bees have different receptors in their eyes that let them see different types of colors. So they can see the bright colors and the white colors. They can see pinks and, and uh, purples. But when it gets into red, the way the light bounces off, their eyes don't pick it up very well. So they don't see red as well. They might still find a red flower by the smell or like or they might kind of find it a different way, but they have a hard time seeing it. But what's different is if you'll remember, I said they can see UV, which is something we can't even see. And so when they look at a flower, they might see different patterns that are invisible to us. It's like a secret ink almost on the flowers that, and some flowers have patterns that like point and say like, this is where the pollen is. And so the bees can see that and hone in. Whereas when we look at a flower, we might not be able to see those like invisible UV patterns. So yeah, it's all about the spectrum of light that different animals can see. So cool. So we're gonna go to Miss Bychek's Hello. class and then Miss Ross's class. So first, Miss Bychek. Um, do you, um, besides bats, do any other mammals um, pollinate? Good question. Yeah, I think a lot of um, like small mammals might be accidental pollinators. Like if they're in the flowers or near the flowers and the pollen like rubs off on their fur, they can carry it to other places. They're just maybe not very efficient. Uh, and so they'd have to be, and they also, you know, they have to have a reason to be looking in the flower. So maybe they might find a, a bug or something in a flower and they're eating it and they might accidentally get some pollen on them and it might move it over. But not many um, mammals need nectar. I know I saw a, a question in the chat about bats. So we said in Canada, a lot of the bats don't eat flower nectar or drink flower nectar. They like bugs and things. But in like uh, other countries, there's some bats like the, the lesser nose bat, or there's one called the Mexican long tongued bat. And those, uh, those like to pollinate uh, flowers and drink the nectar. So, and you know, some eat fruit. So yeah, different mammals will, but a lot of the time it's accidental um, because they're just not encountering flowers as much as some of the insects and smaller things and hummingbirds too. Say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Question. All right, Miss Ross at Watson Road. Go ahead. Um, do bees have any praise? Like, do other animals like to eat bees or something? Oh, so does anything eat bees? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know specific, um, but yes, they provide food for a lot of animals too. As we said, the difference between bees and wasps is bees are, are kind of the uh, vegetarians. They just eat plants, but other things do eat bees. Um, um, the small, small mammals might catch a bee and eat it. Birds certainly will eat bees and other pollinators. And in fact, that's something really important to think about is when, when you have all these little insects and things pollinating, if the insects go away, then there's nothing for the birds to eat. So actually the fact that a lot of pollinators are declining means that there's not as much food for things like birds that eat will eat the bees and the beetles and things. So yeah, bees do have things that eat them. And that's why it's important we protect the bees because if we protect the bees, we'll protect the animals that eat the bees as well. It's a great question. Thank you. All right, Jonathan's been so patient. We're gonna go to Jonathan. And then if there's a question in Mr. Ezard's class, we'd love to hear from you. Um, awesome, they're ready. So we're gonna do Jonathan first and then Mr. Ezard. Over to you, John. Oh. Are wasps more dangerous than bees? That's a good question. More dangerous to people or other animals? That's what I wonder. Uh, and the answer people. is probably yes, I would say, because if you think about it, bees are not really interested in, you know, eating um, any other animals. So they're not very dangerous to other animals because uh, they just eat pollen and nectar. They do have a stinger, but they don't like to use it because often the times when a bee stings, it will lose its stinger. And if a bees lose their stinger, they often will die. So it's in defense only that they will sting. Whereas wasps are a bit more aggressive because they, first of all, they eat other insects. So they do go out and they don't just eat pollen. They'll go out and eat other small insects so they can bite. Uh, and they're territorial. 
So often if you get too close to their hives, then they might sting you. And they are stingers, they, if they sting, um, uh, it can kill them too, but they're much more aggressive. So I'd say they're a little more dangerous, but it's really important again to remember that just because we see a wasp doesn't mean that it's going to hurt us. A lot of wasps are solitary. They're, you know, out doing their own thing, pollinating the flowers, and they're not really interested in you. There's only maybe certain times a year when you have bees that are um, uh, wasps that live in groups that they're being really territorial and they might be more dangerous. And then we just have to pay attention to the signs. And like we said, maybe we won't wear our yellow coat out because then they might think we're a flower. So I think there's things we can do to live with wasps and bees because they're all really important, even if some of them are maybe a little more dangerous than others. Oh, great question. And really, there was a lot of questions around bees and wasps and staying in the chat. So I'm glad we were able to get to that one. Now, Mr. Ezzard's class, Evelyn was standing up beside the computer, but their audio isn't working. So I'm going to ask it, but we're going to pretend that it's Evelyn asking it. So how many flowers do bees pollinate in a typical day? Well, it depends on the bee, but I read that a single bee can pollinate 5,000 flowers. So that's a lot. That's hard work. That's a hard work in bee. And a whole colony, um, you know, like a whole group of bees. I mean, if you think one can do 5,000, you're looking at like 3 million plants for some of those bee colonies in a day, which is pretty crazy. But it depends. Again, like some of the bees are in big groups, they can get a lot done. Others are, are solitary, so they're not maybe quite as hardworking. But yeah, yeah, around like 5,000-ish plants a day for a bee, which is pretty cool. Amazing. So we have a question from YouTube. Um, Agnes wants to know, and I think this is an important question, what would happen if, um, if some of these pollinators went extinct? Oh, that's a real question. And that's an important question because actually there's a lot of threats to pollinators. So, you know, bees and butterflies and all these things, they, they need space to live. They need places with lots of flowers that bloom at different times of the year. So when we change habitats or maybe just plant one kind of flower or plant, there might only be food at certain times of the year. And so they'll like, have so much food and then they'll have no food and they'll get, go hungry or starve. Uh, so if you, and also one other really important thing is if we spray any pesticides, if we try to get rid of the bugs by spraying chemicals, then there won't be any. So that's really happening. And what happens when there's no bees and pollinators is first of all, when we talked about this, the things that eat those bugs suffer because they don't have any food all of a sudden. So it really disrupts some of the ecosystem connections and the food webs and food chains, because now the things that ate those bugs are not going to have food. But also, can you imagine if we didn't have pollinators, how would we get our food? Because remember, pollinators help pollinate corn and flowers, so we would have not as many flowers, not as many seeds growing, trees need pollinators, so all of the plants would have a really hard time pollinating. They might still be wind and water, but if those ones that need help getting the pollen from flower to flower, if there are no pollinators left, then we wouldn't have flowers, and which means we wouldn't have vegetables and fruits and all of those great things that we like to eat. So it would be pretty bad, I think, if we didn't have any pollinators left. That's a great question to think of how uh, interrelated, even though bees seem like an animal that maybe sometimes is even a pest, but yeah. you, you and I and all of our friends here on the call today are really dependent on them for, for our happiness and our, our food and our li all the everything around us and there, we would feel the impacts if they were to to um, somehow not survive a disease or, um, or or something else would impact their territory and and yeah okay we have a friend Miss Ross who's been waiting very patiently by the computer for his turn go ahead sir why can't a bee hear Griffin stuff but they can only hear their buzzing. Ooh, hmm. why can't bees, you said they can't hear? I didn't quite hear the question. Can you repeat it? Um, why can bees only hear their buzzing? Hmm, okay. Well, bees are really interesting because bees don't hear with their ears. They notice sounds and vibrations with their whole body, so, and especially their antennas, and because they have these sensitive hairs all over their body. So it's movement of the air and stuff. Um, so sound will move the air. 
that makes them hear the sound. So it's not like they have ears to listen to, their body feels the, the air move and that's how they kind of hear sound. So that's sort of how bee hearing works. They don't have ears like us. Amazing. All right, Jonathan, you've been waiting patiently again with another question. Why don't you go ahead? I didn't get a, I didn't have a question. I forgot to put my hands oh, yeah. down. <laughs> no worries. You're just giving us a high five then. That's great too. <laughs> All right. Well, I know that in Madame Slavin's class online, Brayden was wondering what makes a better pollinator, um, butterflies or moths? And I think that could be um, expanded to like, are there like the best pollinators and okay pollinators or or is everything sort of just really good at pollinating? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's a bit of both. There are some pollinators that are just really efficient. And like we talked about bees take the top spot. They get number one place. They are very good pollinators and they pollinate lots of different things. But if we think about pollinators, I'd say there's not always one that's better or worse, they're just different. So remember we talked about some flowers bloom at night. Well, the bee might be a really great pollinator, but it's not awake at night. So that moth, which maybe doesn't pollinate as much or maybe work quite as hard, it still pollinates that plant at night. So it's really important to that plant. So some pollinators might be super important to like just a couple plants and some might be important to a bunch. But, you know, I think they're all important. They're just different. And as we learned today, they're, they, they help different flowers. So we need them all because plants are different and they might need, you know, a hummingbird with a long beak or a butterfly with its proboscis straw nose to get the pollen or the nectar. So yeah, I think bees take top spot. They're the most efficient pollinators, but they're all equally important. And then Tazneem has been very patient. Her computer died. She had to run and get a power cord, but she's back and she has her questions. Go, go ahead, Tazneem. Um, do you know how we were seeing, you know how we were seeing how um, if we kill all of them, then they won't be any more, mm -hmm. but don't they have babies? They do. Yeah. Yeah, but they need the food from the flowers and, you know, they need to um, be able to have the food and their water and their shelter and their space to be successful. So they will reproduce and they'll have babies. But, you know, if we if we swat them away or we kill some or we get rid of their food source or we spray them, they will be less and less and less. And as that goes down, there'll be less diversity. And diversity means like different types, right? So there might be only a few left in one spot and none left over there and slowly they'll decline. So it doesn't just happen all at once. It just happens over you know, a slow amount of time. And eventually we might find that there just aren't that many left. And so it makes it really hard or there might not be any left in one place and they'll still be in another place. And that's what we call, you know, they're endangered when there's really not many left. They're either threatened or endangered. Um, they can be extirpated. That means they're gone from certain places, but they're still around or extinct, which means they're gone forever. All right. Well, we are down to the last. Okay. And so, uh, and I know we have so many more questions here in the chat on YouTube. Oh my goodness. It was an amazing day. But I was hoping, Kaylee, you could tell maybe the students one thing. Going out of today's meeting, we've, we've learned about pollinators. We know they're important. We don't want them to sacrifice their, where they live or, or anything like that. So what's one thing going out of today's meeting that these students can do to help pollinators in our communities? That is an amazing question, Sarah. And I have one last slide I'll show okay. you all. Because really, if you want to help pollinators, it's all about habitat. And hopefully you all heard the word habitat, but there's four parts. Food, water, about habitat. and space. Habitat. Yeah. yeah, habitat. So what you can do is make sure there's lots of food for pollinators. You can plant native flowers that bloom all year. So different flowers in your garden or on your balcony. Um, they need water. Actually, butterflies like to mud puddle and they'll get nutrients from mud. So you can leave out a little dish of water with some rocks or some sand uh, and some water for the pollinators because they need water too. Uh, you can also make shelter. So if you have a yard, leave a pile of leaves in the corner of the yard. Bees need some shelter. Uh, some of them like to make their nests in those things. Or if you don't have a yard, you can make an insect hotel by getting 
strips of bamboo, you can make little structures and make homes for um, bees and insects yourself. And then space, we just need to leave a lot of space for them. So with lots of different plants for them. And you can do that by putting food, water and shelter out. So these are the big things to think about and things you can think about in your home and your yard and your balcony is how can I provide some food, some shelter, some water and some space for pollinators so that they can thrive. Amazing. Well, I think that's such a great message for us to all think about as we leave today and say, how can I help the pollinators in my community? And I know I can. That, that these aren't, we don't need a lot of money to do it. We don't need a lot of space to do it. That we can do little things that help the pollinators in our community to stay strong and healthy and really help us stay strong and healthy at the same time. So thank you, Kaylee, for joining us today. Thank you for our schools from Nova Scotia, Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta, BC, across the north, wherever you join from today. I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Wave. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. I'll never see you again. <laughs> there we go.